notre émission African Verary Show, euh, African Verary Show pour euh, les mois, les numéros du mois de mars. Alors, comme d'habitude, notre émission euh, contribue à l'intégration des immigrants vivant ici et à Vermont, plus particulièrement à Burlington, à Winoski, Essex et Williston, euh, pourquoi pas Colchester. Alors, pour ces numéros, nous avons le plaisir de recevoir des invités spéciaux que vous allez eh, découvrir. Pourquoi Parce que c'est très important. Nous allons traiter d'un sujet eh, capital qui fait, eh, qui a la une du monde eh, et qui, qui est aussi, eh, qui cause beaucoup de conséquences néfastes, surtout euh, dans euh, les pays eh, qu'on appelle la République démocratique du Congo, un pays beau, grand, riche. Eh, en tous les minéraux. Raison pour laquelle, sur ces plateaux, nous allons aussi décortiquer le sujet entre avec le panafricanisme. La fois passée, j'avais des invités ici, c'était Robin et Sandy, parce que nous sommes en train de préparer et Africander la journée et africaine liée à la commémoration de la création de l'Union africaine. Mais spécialement ici à Vermont, nous allons fêter, nous allons célébrer le 11 mai de 15h à 22h à l'Association des Africains. Donc nous aurons une conférence, nous aurons à manger, il y aura à boire et nous, il y aura de la très belle musique au rythme de l'Afrique. Alors aujourd'hui là j'ai deux invités, il y a Robin Lloyd de Toed Freedom et aussi M. Patrick Falla qui est expert en droits humains et activiste et aussi inspecteur des droits humains en République démocratique du Congo. Mais il vit longtemps ici aux États-Unis, bien sûr c'est un citoyen américain et originaire de la République démocratique du Congo, dont nous avons des sujets importants sur le panafricanisme, mais aussi sur la situation de la guerre économique en République démocratique du Congo sur la partie Est depuis... Euh, l'année 1993 ou bien année 1993 en français de France, et il y a beaucoup d'impact sur les problèmes de la guerre économique en République démocratique du Congo où tout le monde veut vraiment prendre le minéraux du Congo, mais ça crée beaucoup de conséquences néfastes au niveau des enfants, mais aussi au niveau des femmes. Et pourtant, comme nous le savons bien, Partout dans le monde, même ici aux États-Unis, si vous touchez une femme, si vous commettez ce qu'on appelle la violence, vous allez être sanctionné très sévèrement. Mais en République démocratique du Congo, il y a beaucoup d'abus liés à la guerre économique, mais le monde est vraiment euh, silencieux et on ne sait pas ce qu'il faut faire. Et voilà, c'est un sujet que nous allons euh, décortiquer. Et le titre, c'est euh, « Sit at the table ». Donc, « We are here, so we're going to talk about panafricanism » and economic war uh, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and uh, many consequences uh, uh, related with the economic war in the east part of the DRC. So today we have uh, two guests, uh, is uh, Mr. Uh, Patrick Fala, uh, who uh, is a human rights expert, activist and inspector in the Democratic Republic of Congo also Robin Lloyd, last time uh, we were here with Sandy Berry, we, we, we're going to talk about Pan-Africanism because we are, we are planning to celebrate African Day uh, on May the 11th, 3 p.m. to 11 at ALV. So we're going to have uh, um, a presentation. We have African food party, big event. So please uh, take the time to listen to us for our advocacy regarding the Democratic Republic of Congo. Alors, à vous, vous allez vous présenter. Je commence avec Robin. I think you, you understand the French, right? Oui, oui. OK, allez-y. Mais je, je vais essayer de parler, English. de dire quelque chose en français. En français mais, oui. mais 
mainly in English. Okay. Um, yeah, so I am uh, really um, excited to be on the show with you and to talk with uh, folks about Pan-Africanism. Um, and, you know, it all stems from the fact that in 1957, I was, I, my father was a journalist and was uh, covering events in Africa. And because I was at Antioch College, he was able to arrange that I would be his secretary. And so we took a, a trip around Africa and uh, we went to the, the Congo and all of that was very moving to me. And especially the fact that this was right at the time of the blossoming of uh, Pan-Africanism because Nkrumah was elected in, uh, in Ghana and he was a very brilliant supporter of uh, Pan-Africanism seeing it as something that had to, now with the uh, colonialism ending, that the African countries could start to come together and, um, and, and form and, and honor their, their own heritage and not the heritage of the, um, of the colonial countries. And then after Nkrumah got elected, then um, Lumumba got elected, and of course, then he got assassinated. But that that time was such a, a fertile time for movements in Africa, and so now, what is it? Uh, Fifty years, uh, seventy years later, finally, uh, n this um, October, there will be another Pan African con Congress, and it will be in Togoland, as you. Mentioned, I just want to uh, say that um, the person who came to the um, uh, Africa Day last year was Gan uh, Dr. Ganaka Lakote, and he is he is a pa passionate supporter of of uh, Pan Africanism, and the way he describes it, he calls it the vision for the redemption of Africa, the Africa spiritual, cultural, social, political, and economic renewal. This will be the cradle of a new Pan-African consciousness. So he, uh, he was a very eloquent speaker for us last year, and I hope he will be brought in um, for some of the events we're going to have this, fall, this spring and next fall. Ok, merci beaucoup. La fois passée, nous avions parlé en long et en large concernant le panafricanisme. Donc, elle a été déjà en Afrique avec son père à l'époque, en 1967, euh, parce que son père était journaliste. Mais aussi, dans ce cadre-là, elle a été au Congo aussi à l'époque. À l'époque, je crois que c'était euh, euh, Zahir. Zahir. Mm -hmm. Alors, Zahir, le président Mobutu, euh, il est très puissant. Alors... Elle a beaucoup assisté son père qui était journaliste et puis elle a assisté quand on avait élu Kwame Kuma comme président du Ghana. Donc elle connaît un peu beaucoup de choses. On avait déjà parlé dans notre émission passée. Alors à l'Obiboé, donc à Zali vraiment beaucoup, à l'Ingakaming Afrique, pourquoi Parce que dans la période où il y a un mouvement, il y a un mouvement panafricanisme, dans le niveau de l'Afrique, Ghana, et na niveau pe a nini a mboka na biso lumumba e, a koma ki pe na mboka na biso parce que papa na zaki journaliste alors ayi mo makambo belé yango la fois passé to limbola ki bino belé sur ça et le lopé to invité ye pour que azala awa wanduko wa penzi leo tuna tutasema mambo mbiri ju ya mambo ya ya umoja ya Afrika na mambo ya vita ile iko katika inchi ya Congo alors Robin, on a eu un peu de temps, il y a eu un peu de temps, il y a eu un peu de temps, il y a eu un peu de Congo, donc Congo à l'époque Zahir. Alors il y a eu un peu de temps, 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 mais Léo, tout à ce moment, j'ai mambo ya inangaria mambo ya inchi yetu ya Congo, j'ai mali yetu, gisibiko wanabeba mali yetu, et puis, 
batu ma konsekansi kwa ya mingi, batu biko na banawa banamuke, batoto. Alors, njoto sese empe ku develope, ku ye misyon yetu ya leo. Alors, nous allons donner la parole à l'inspecteur des droits humains, M. Patrick Fala. Comme ça, on va commencer notre conversation. Merci beaucoup, euh, M. Jules. Merci, Mme Robin. Je pense que nous avons cette conversation, mais nous allons parler de tout ce que Jules et Robin ont expliqué à vous. Uh, but we might be talking about it in two languages, French and English. Donc, on peut parler en deux langues parce que la conversation est bilingue, je pense, by lingua. Um, I am Patrick Fala. Um, I am a human rights activist and expert in human rights and inspector in the DRC, Democratic Republic of the Congo, before I moved Mofi here in Unary State many years ago. So, uh, um, Robin tried to explain to you about the Pan-Africanism in Africa. And uh, I think, in my understanding, we cannot dissociate the Pan-Africanism and the human rights. I think both subjects or both, you know, go together. So, Pan-Africanism and human rights are two subjects must be associated together to be talking about. So this is the reason why we are here. Uh, I've been invited by Jules and Robin, so we're going to be talking about it in Africa and especially in the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, the country where I was born. I came from there, so I know about human rights situation and some of Pan-Africanism people, as we know. So we're going to talk about it during this show, this meeting, this conversation. I can say that. So, yes. And uh, thank you, Juice, for inviting me. And uh, thank you, Robin. So we are together. So try, we're going to try to share uh, what we know about uh, the subject for we're trying to, uh, to talk about today. Thanks. Okay. Well, I could uh, just start it off uh, by referring to this book of, on, on uranium. I mean, that was the first conflict uh, mineral that changed so much in the world uh, because there was a Belgian man, an engineer, who found the, uh, the ores of uranium in, uh, in one of the uh, Congolese provinces and realized even though it was, you know, a, a nu nuclear bomb had never been created, people didn't really know what the what the uh, uh, significance of uranium was, that the, it was a f fissile, it could be, uh, you know, uh, neutrons could be shot at it and it could divide and have critical mass. Uh, all these components were not known at that point, but this uh, 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 engineer, his name is, uh, I mean, I think he should be in, in, the, in, in the books. His name is Edgar Sanguier. He, before, the, um, uh, before World War II, he, he had the insight to ship loads of uranium ore to the United States and put it in a, in a warehouse without really knowing what it would do. He didn't want the, um, the uh, Germans to get hold of it. Anyway, that action created enough uranium in the United States for, uh, for making a bomb, and it was the, the bomb that, that, uh, that destroyed Hiroshima in 1945 that mainly came from the Congo. So what a contribution to, uh, to we, was it destruction or salvation or what that uh, took place there? Mm -hmm. Because if that uranium had not been sent to the United States, there would not have been enough uranium around to, uh, to make a bomb. Anyway, I just wanted to bring up that sort of mm -hmm. key fact at the very beginning of conflict minerals, but now there are so many other conflict minerals. You should tell us about it. Uh, thank you, Robin. Um, 
You're talking about the uranium, um, the one who tried to help you United State to make the bomb, you know, for the World War II, I think. But maybe you need more information about that uranium, where it came from. That uranium came from uh, the Democratic Republic of <coughs> the Congo. That's why they took it, especially in uh, the region we call uh, Katanga, you know. Uh, it was in the, the uranium coming from Shinkolobwe. Shinkolobwe is a, a city, is a city in Katanga, so that's where they found that uh, uranium to help United States to make the bomb for the night, uh, the Second World War. And uh, the Congo has been for a long time in the good relationship with United States. So United States used to to be in the good connection, you know, diplomatically, even economically with the Congo for long, long, long time, many years ago. That's the reason why we can say even actually United States was the first one to try to discover, to discover the mining in the Congo. That's why they took uranium, because in that period, the uranium was uh, very important to make the bomb, but many people in the world, they didn't know that. Many countries in the world, they didn't know that. But United States discovered that uranium from the Congo. They brought that here, and they make the bomb. So that uranium exactly, and the people talk about in the story, in the books, you can go online, we're going to discover where that uranium came from the Congo. Mm -hmm. So the uranium came, exactly came from the Congo. Because Congo is a very rich country. Uh, Congo has too many mining, too many minerals. Actually, we're going to talk about it during this speech, during this conversation. And they're trying to help, uh, you know, many countries in the world. But the way they're taking it from the Congo is not the way the Congolese people are expecting them to get it from the Congo. So they're taking it the very wrong way. I think we are already in the conversation. I can develop to say uh, that period of the time, the United States tried to take the uranium from the Congo. But now, the same uranium and many other minerals coming from the Congo all around the world People need those minerals because Congo is very rich. Even right now, we don't know what we can try to find in the ground in the Congo. Too many. <laughs> Today, they're talking about the cobalt. They're talking about electric cars. They're talking about mm -hmm. diamond, gold, silver, many things, doing like the rockets, stuff like that, st stuff like that, you know, trying to make airplanes like electronics, devices, cotton. all of this stuff are made with the cotton, the mineral we call cotton in the Congo. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The cotton is getting, is, they're trying to get it from the Congo. The uranium, electric batteries, you know, making electric cars, everything they try to get it from the Congo. Congo by itself as a country, it's giving all around the world, too many minerals. But the way they're taking it from the Congo, that's exactly what I said. Uh, Congolese people uh, are not happy with that because they're taking it now by being in the contract with the Congo government, or uh, being in the contract with uh, uh, the Congo business about mining. They're taking it by force, by killing people. They're taking it by forcing kids that's we're talking about human rights using kids using uh, you know ladies you know women sometimes pregnant women and very little kids they are supposed to be at school but those kids they never been to school they're using them in the mining to try to extract the mineral because some business people and some countries in the around the world, they want that, that minerals. They should be talking with the government to get it, you know, legally, to get it by the right way, but they're not taking it by the right way. They don't taking it leg legally. They're taking it by force, by killing people, by giving guns to people who are trying to be like we call rebels, the rebel. Mm -hmm. that's, uh, that's the reason why, so, yes. Mm -hmm. Should I? Okay. Yeah, um, I, 
the organization that I'm a part of is Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, and we have a section in the Congo, in Kinshasa, and they have done a, a, a study of uh, artisanat mining in the Congo, and they've looked into uh, the way children and, and women play a very significant role, and as Patrick has said, they, you know, they're brought in and they, the kids should be going to school and, and so on. So it's, um, uh, uh, I, was, I was pleased that our section was able to do that research. And so my question is, I guess, that how is it that these uh, minerals are taken out of the Congo I mean, it's not by airplane, it's by trucks, I gather, going to adjacent countries. So what is going on that allows something illegal, really, to be going on on such a mass basis in, in Central Africa there? Yeah, thank you, Robin. So the minerals are being taken from the Congo by, like you said, the tracks, but they, they are taking the minerals by the airplanes too, because there is some parts of the Congo, the government don't have control mm -hmm. of those parts of the country because they, you know, the business people around the world, like I can say here in United States, in London, you know, uh, in, in, in France, uh, Germany, China, all over around the world, the business people, they need all of those minerals from the Congo. They're giving people guns, and people are going to try to extract this mineral in the ground, not by themselves, but they're trying to use kids, like we say, instead of sending these kids to school, the kids are trying to extract the minerals they've been using, abused in the mining, and those minerals are being shipped by two different countries, to those different countries I, I talked about before, by the country neighbors. They're using country neighbors, as we know. You can go online, you can check, you can see too what many countries. Country. Sorry? What countries? They're using many country neighbors to try to use the minerals. We can say Rwanda, Uganda, Burundi, even down Zambia. Zambia? Yes, Zambia. Too many countries, like in the east part of the Congo. They're using those countries as the bridge you know, to let pass those minerals, illegal minerals, blood minerals. Yes, we have blood in the cell phone. We have blood in the computers. Mm -hmm. The cell phone we're using, the computer we're using, we have blood of people are being killed in the Congo and kids are being used, abused in the Congo to try to extract those minerals. Mm -hmm. They're trying to get this mineral, you know, by those country neighbors, like I said, you know, without paying taxes, without talking with the government, it's just by the force. And uh, who are doing this, as you know, uh, I don't know, maybe you don't know, but people who are trying to extract these minerals, it's not only the governments of the countries I, I talk about, it's the business people. Business people, people are trying to make money. People are trying to make cell phones, electronic devices, cars, electronic cars, electric batteries, electric cars. So all of these people, they're working together around the world to try to get this mineral very cheap, mm -hmm. very f for free, I can say for free, without paying anything, without buying it, mm -hmm. just making, putting kids and women in the, the mining to try to do this job for free. And kids are being killed inside because getting the minerals, the, getting the mining, working in the mining, it's very dangerous for kids. Mm -hmm. It's very dangerous because we have a, like a public health issue over there too. These kids, they're not going to school, they don't go, there is no hospital. They're being sick with the mining. Mm -hmm. Mining can get you sick, mm -hmm. can give you different kind of di disease, you know. C can you say something about the war there? Because there's actually a lot of this area is in what one, one would call a war zone and there are militias. Now, who pays the militias and what is their impact? The militias are being paid by, like I say, business people from United States, where we are here. <laughs> business people from London, from, uh, I mean, uh, 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 p business people from France, from Germany, from China, all over around the world. Th the first, those are the business people. And the governments, all, well, all of those countries must be uh, trying to regulate 
telling those business people not to bring like uh, blood mining in the country to make all of electronic devices without paying or without getting it legally in the Congo. So this is exactly what is happening in the Congo. Mm -hmm. That's why we're going to find too many kids are being killed. Mm -hmm. Women are being killed. People are getting disease. Uh, Nobody is trying to take care of them uh, because they just need mining. They, they need minerals and uh, they're not taking care of these kids. Now, recently there was an election for president of the Congo. And uh, uh, could you or maybe Jules also uh, help explain that? Because it was the incumbent that won, or at least uh, theoretically won the election. But there were others who had a more uh, challenging um, attitude towards some of these serious problems in the Congo, and unfortunately, they did not succeed to win. Yes, election, I can say, election in the Congo, uh, we have election everywhere around the world, you know. <laughs> we don't have the perfect election everywhere. Even here in the United States, one time we have election with some of the president too, where they, they've never been agreed, they've never been happy with the the way the election passed, and uh, we see many things, even in the Congo, even in many countries, we have elections, and we had elections in the Congo too, but some people, they cannot be happy, some people, they, but if people, they're not happy, they have to sit and to talk about it, and instead of taking the gun, and they're trying to be like uh, the rebel, like we say in French, the rebel, you creating the groups of rebel to take the gun and to kill population. And that population you're killing, they have, they are not politicians. They're doing nothing. They are for nothing about the election. They are just population. But you're going to see behind that people are not happy because they're trying to show like they don't agree with the president. But behind that, they trying to do some business, like mining business, mm. getting some minerals in the Congo, but talking to the words like we don't agree with the president, we don't agree the way the election being, you know, organized in the mm -hmm. Congo, but it's not really that one. It's yeah. the money. People are doing business. Mm -hmm. It's about business. Well, we only have a few minutes here, and um, I want to ask the two of you, you, you are part of a Congolese community in the diaspora. You are American citizens now. Mm -hmm. I think it would be wonderful if... Uh, the Congolese people here could unite with some of the activists and with my organization, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, to to petition our um, our representatives to be more aware of this horrible situation and to make some changes, possibly in the uh, U.S. relationship with the government of the Congo. I think Drew can uh, explain to that because we don't have too many time, but maybe next time we're going to have more time and more chance to do those kind of talk, those kind of conversation to talk about more. That's the reason why we're passing on the TV. We're trying to explain about what is happening in the Congo. And uh, we're having some many, many, uh, uh, you know, uh, organizations here in uh, America and around the world. Congolese people try to talk to speak up and then to show the world exactly what's happening in the Congo. So, and Jules can, uh, can say more maybe if he has something to, to add, please. So this is a good idea because we have many, many organizations, so they are leading about that. They, are they do the advocacy to help, uh, uh, they are speak loudly about Congo, uh, but also we need uh, more support from uh, United States of America because uh, we are here, we, we went to school here, so why not they can support people who they have uh, many experience from here and go to mm -hmm. lead in our own country because many things happen, people they try to move because of there is no justice, there is no peace uh, also. Uh, uh, sometimes uh, we don't have a good leadership uh, in uh, many levels, but with many things we learn here, uh, I think we'll be able to, to, to lead mm -hmm. in our own country. So. I think we can change uh, many things instead of uh, to stay uh, like quietly or without to saying to do, something yeah. to do the advocacy. Mm -hmm. And this is the reason on Af Africa Day, the May 11th, we are calling all people to come to join us 
and we're gonna have a good presentation. So people, they're gonna, uh, I think they're gonna change the behavior. They're gonna speak up about uh, many countries, not only from Congo, but we have many, many uh, African countries. They need a good leadership. Mm -hmm. Alors, je vais terminer en français. Mm -hmm. Merci euh, pour euh, notre émission d'aujourd'hui parce que nous sommes à la fin. Merci à Robin, merci à M. Patrick Fala. C'était vraiment un sujet très important, très capital. On a parlé vraiment en peu de temps, mais c'est profond. Alors, nous vous invitons à la journée africaine, Africa Day, le 11 mai, de 15h à 23h. On va manger, on va écouter des, des très bonnes présentations, on va danser pour que nous puissions créer cette force au niveau de la diaspora. Mm -hmm. Tu vois, Robin, nous aide beaucoup plus, elle est penchée vraiment à l'Afrique, pour que nous puissions vraiment eh, changer des choses. Il faut la féliciter, c'est une femme brave, elle aime l'Afrique, elle aime tous les pays africains. Alors, merci, merci, et à la prochaine. Alors, nous disons, Mbote en Lingala, à Barize, nous en Swahili, tout à Onana, Merci. Ciao. Ciao.